right, guys. First things first. Please leave your comments down below about whether you rather have my face on the video like it is now, or whether you rather have a video without me in it at all, just my voice over it. We want to optimize this channel. We want to take baby steps, and this is the first thing we want to do. So, guys, make sure to leave your thoughts down below. Welcome to the final problem in arrays and strings. That is the unlucky thirteen. Now. This is a really hard problem. This is the only hard level problem in this lesson. And it combines many concepts, combines math concepts, combines programming concepts. And we've got to bring them all together if you want to get the most optimal solution. With that being said, let's have a look at the problem unlucky 13. Write a program to calculate the total number of strings that are made up of exactly n characters. None of the strings can have 13 as a substring. And the strings may contain any integer from 0 to 9 repeated any number of times. So let's have a look at what the question means first. So let's imagine we've got n equals 2. That means it's a two digit number. What are the possible digits? 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 as well. But 13 is invalid because we can never have 13 as a substring. So all the numbers, all the two digit numbers, excluding 13 are valid. So if we include 00, zero and go up until 99, there are a total of 100 two digit numbers, but we're excluding 13, meaning the total number of valid two digit numbers is 99. Let's also have a look at three digit numbers. Now, how many valid three digit numbers are there? 000, 001, 002, up until 999. That's a total of 1000 valid three digit numbers. What are the invalid numbers among these? We can't have 13 as a substring, meaning we can't have 013, we can't have 113, 213, 313, 413, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 913. That means we've already excluded 10 candidates. Furthermore, we can't have 130, 131, 132, 133, 134, up until 139. That's because the first two digits are 1, 3, 13. So we've got a total of 20 invalid strings among all the 1,000 strings, meaning the number of valid strings are 1,000 minus 20, which is 980. If we've got two digits, we've already discussed the number of valid strings is 99. If we've got only one digit, the number of valid strings will be 10, 0 to 9. And furthermore, we've got to print the result of each query modulo 1000009. We'll have a look at that condition a little later. First, we'll try obtaining a solution for a general scenario. Then we'll look at the modular part. But before we do that, think about it, think on it yourselves. And once you're done attempting the question, head on back. Remember, as always, the coding link is in the description. Let's have a look at this right here, a six digit number where n equals six. We always want to reduce the time complexity. So one good way to start is by trying to divide it into smaller parts. Let's try dividing this string into two. Now we've got two three digit numbers, one on the left and one on the right. Now, how many valid numbers can go on the left? We know the left three digits can be filled with 000 up until 999. That's a total of thousand strings. But as we already discussed, 20 of these are invalid. So the number of valid strings here on the left portion are 980. Similarly, there are 980 valid strings on the right. A valid string means it does not have 13 in it. Now let the total number of valid three digit strings be X. Left and right, both of these will be X and we know X is equal to 980. So the total number of valid strings will be 980 times 980. However, this is not our final result. That's because we can have a certain scenario where the last digit of the first string is one and the first digit of the second string is three. Just to give you an example, 001 is a valid string because there's no 13 in it. 300, 300 is a valid string because there's no 13 in it. Separately, they're both valid, but when you put them together, they're invalid because you get a 13 in the middle. We've got to exclude all these special strings. How many of these are there? 
Now, if we fix one here, and if we fix three here, how many spaces are left? Two are left. Let's call this Y. The right side will be Y as well, because there are two spaces on the right. We already know the value of Y is 99. So the total number of these strings, which are invalid, is 99 times 99. Now, how do we calculate the final answer? We've got to remove the invalid strings from what we calculated beforehand. That is, we've got to subtract y into y from x into x. We have already established that x into x is 980 into 980. y into y is 99 into 99, which is why this is your result. Now, say we've got an odd numbered string, say n equals 5. Now, we're going to have 2 on one side and 3 on the other side. It doesn't matter which is which. One side will have one less than the other. So let the total number of valid two-digit strings be x and three-digit strings be y. Again, we know that x is going to be 99 and y is going to be 980. Just like before, there's a certain special scenario that we've got to exclude. What is that scenario? Where one is here and three is here. Now, how many invalid strings are there overall? We've got to multiply the number of one digit strings with the number of two digit strings. We already know that this value is X, the number of two digit strings. And let's call the number of one digit ones Z. In this case, Z is going to be 10. So this value will be 99 times 10. So finally, we've got to subtract the latter from the former. In other words, X into Y minus X into Z. X is a common factor here. So we take X out and what's left is Y into Z in the brackets. The result is, as you can see on your screen right here. Before we head on to the coding section, I'd like to give a massive thanks to Dhruv Baveja. I saw his solution online. I don't know if he was the first one to think it up, but it was a really elegant solution and it was what helped me solve this problem. Now guys, if you'll remember, in the beginning I said that this was a combination of math and programming. Here's where the programming aspect of it comes in. If we see, if we compile and test it here, all our sample test cases are going to be passed. But when we hit submit, here's where we see our time limit has been exceeded. The time and space requirements for this problem, the constraints are very tight. We've got to find out a way to bypass that. We've got to figure out how to solve it in less time. That's why we're going to be using certain advanced programming techniques. The numbers are bound to repeat themselves because there are only so many numbers that you can get once you break them down, once you keep dividing by two. So let's say you've calculated the value of n equals two. Now, in order to calculate n equals four, we're going to have to break it down to n equals two and two. So it makes sense to store those two values. Also, it's possible to have duplicate test cases. So suppose we've got n equals six, which we've calculated right here. And the next test case is n equals six again. Why do we need to recalculate it? We've already computed this exact same result. So we might as well store it somewhere and just return that as the answer. This process of storing important information is known as caching. And that is what we're going to be using here. Let's ignore these first two if conditions for now. These two are going to be the base cases. If we don't have these two conditions, the program is going to continuously keep repeating itself. This function will keep calling itself infinite times. So we need to have some base condition. If n equals zero, we're going to return one and store it in our cache. Why? A string of length zero is an empty string and there's only one possible empty string that is the empty string itself. If n is one, if we have only one digit to fill, what numbers can we put inside? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. A total of 10 digits. That's why we return 10 and we store it in our cache. If n% percent 2 equals 0, in other words, if it's an even number, we've already established it's x into x minus y into y. And if it's an odd number, we also calculate z and we calculate x into z minus y. Now, why do we perform this percent mod here? One interesting thing about modulo is that we can perform it in various stages when we're talking about multiplication. Let's not talk about massive numbers. Let's just suppose it was modulo three and the two numbers in question were five and 10. Five into 10 mod three is nothing but 50 mod three. 
the closest multiple of 3 is 48. So the remainder is going to be 2. If instead of that we perform 5 mod 3 times 10 mod 3, what does that give us? 5 mod 3 gives us 2 because the remainder is naturally 2. 10 mod 3 gives us 1 because the closest multiple is 9, the remainder is 1. The result is going to be 2 again. Why does that work? Let's have a look. Let's break the numbers down. Let's first write it as a multiple of 3 and add the remainder at the end. Now if we expand this, we get 3 into 9 plus 3 into 1 plus 2 into 9 plus 2 into 1. Once we mod it with 3, naturally, the first 3 terms will get cancelled and we'll only be left with 2 mod 3. If we break it down and do 5 mod 3 into 10 mod 3, we'll see something very similar. Now, since we're writing it in the form of 3 and plus remainder, the first term will naturally get cancelled. So 3 will get cancelled, we'll be left with 2 mod 3 on the left and 1 mod 3 on the right. 2 mod 3 times 1 mod 3 gives us an answer of 2, similar to the previous answer. Now, one last thing we do is split the cache into 2. That's because it exceeds the memory limit if we put all the results into just one cache. So the part that's inside this if condition and inside this else condition is exactly the same. The only difference is we're using two different caches. Finally, if n is in the cache, in other words, if we've already calculated the value, just return the cached value. The cache is nothing but a hash map, essentially, a dictionary. So we can return it in a time of O of 1. There's no computation required. Let us see if our code works. Once we hit compile and test, our samples have been passed. And once we hit submit, the true test is being accepted slowly. Yes, it has been accepted for each and every single test case. So guys, that's the solution to unlucky 13. By far one of the hardest problems I've seen, but the techniques you use here will stay with you forever. Caching is something you can use in a variety of different competitive coding problems. Especially problems like this, where T is given first, followed by T test cases. Caching is very important and very useful in these scenarios. So this was the solution, guys. And this was the more intuitive method. There's actually another method we can use to solve it. And that's by using matrix exponentiation. If you want me to tackle that solution as well, leave your comments down below, guys. And I'll make sure to make a separate video for that. The same problem with another method. Hit the three buttons on your screen right here if you like the video. And I'll see you all next time.